Hey everybody, it is Radley Valentine here with your Angel Tarot show, and I've got my dear friend and marketing guru, Mooney Syed. Hey, Mooney, how are you doing? Hey, Rad, I'm doing great. I'm so happy to be here and sharing all of these wonderful insights with you, and congratulations on your podcast. It's a huge success, I gotta say, so Yay. big congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, it's it's a lot of fun. I yeah. mean, it really is a lot of fun and it is, it is exciting to see the numbers go to, it is exciting. So I do love that. But so, but today, today we are talking about why would you launch a Tarot business? Why, why oh, would why would you ever do anything <laughs> like that at all? Yes. Why <laughs> would you have a spiritually based business of any kind? I really couldn't say, Rad, could you, do you have any idea why somebody might want to do that? Joy. Happiness, happiness, joy, the opportunity to help people to see for me, the my favorite thing in my entire life is to see it in their eyes when they are like getting the whole angel thing, when they're like in this whole place of like figuring it out. I, I, uh, oh, I didn't tell you, I got to spend some time with Denver peeps yesterday who just oh, happened God. to be in town and they brought along a friend and the, the, it was a husband and wife and their friend, a woman. And the two ladies were like, I just don't get this whole angel thing. How do you do this? And it was so much fun to like go, you're making it too hard. You're just making it too hard. But but for business, for me, it's like I could be an accountant <laughs> or I can do this, right? And I can do what gives me joy and what makes me happy. And, and when you do it right, you can be in a place of abundance and prosperity in, in doing it as well. Yeah. And that's, I think, the that's the big why, I think, behind a lot of it is that people are looking for something else. People are looking for a way to express themselves to take this gift that they've always had, or maybe they're awakening it to it later in life. And they're like, okay, what's the reason that I have this? Why do I have this thing? Why do I have this gift? What am I supposed to do with it? And you know, I think the time for keeping that hidden and keeping it all to yourself has passed. Like right. we are now in a whole new world quite literally uh, new world. <laughs> air, close your eyes we're gonna get sued for that um, <laughs> <it's canceled laughs> <their delete. laughs> um but but here we are right we're looking at for the first time ever more people awakening to the fact that they are spiritual and not religious right so you're seeing all of these people that were a part of organized religion and i'm not knocking organized religion sometimes no. it really works for people right. but it didn't work for me i don't know that it no. worked for you i don't know <laughs> that it works for some of the people we know <clears throat> but it's it's one of those opportunities to take that kind of infinite part of yourself and be able to do something with it here on earth instead of it just being this concept that's far far away um and i know that's for me like the stuff that i do is all centered around like i don't want people to have to do this part alone so there's so many different ways that you could start a business, but why not do it in a way that aligns with your spiritual thought processes and your spiritual beliefs? So that's what we're doing. We're talking about that today. Right, right. And I, you know, it's like, I think because I'm a recovering certified public accountant that I went into this a lot more thinking that I'm a lot more with a, a, a knowledge of there's going to be a balance here. I'm going to give to people, but I'm also going to receive in equal measure. And th this is how I'm going to make a living and is to, to do this, is to be in that place of joyfulness and happiness. And I think, too, that a lot of people might come who are spiritually based people might come to my my classes live or video and not have any clue that they have any intention of creating a spiritually based business. They're just there to learn how to read cards and, you know, maybe to do it for family and friends and, uh, or for themselves. And, and as they move through the process, they start to awaken to the concept of this is so much fun. There is, it, it's so meaningful. It has so much power to help heal people and I could do this, but they need the skill set. They yeah. need the skill set. Well, and there's a bunch of things to talk about there. I mean, we as spiritual people or people who have gifts or however you define it, 
have a hard time exchanging those gifts for money, right? That's a huge issue that a lot of people have. Well, this came from the divine. This came from spirit. This came from the universe. How could I do something so dirty as to like charge money for it? Mm. And that's like the first block that you have to get through when it comes to this. Like, I know what you're talking about, Rad, at your events. And I'm sure this, I, let me, let me ask this and see if it's true. In the same way, when we're doing stuff online and you see the red arrow, what do you see when somebody's like gets it? Like when it clicks, is it what does that look like to you energetically when you see somebody just kind of like rapidly expand like that in a learning environment? They they start to glow for yeah. starters. They start to glow, and um, they there there is a sparkle and a smile in their eyes. It's 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 in their eyes where you see the awe. Mm -hmm. you know, A-W-E, awe. And, you know, my favorite emotion, I think, of all is awe. And um, I think that you see it on them. It's painted on them. And they, you know, when we do live events, which are my favorites, of course, but I do, I do, I like video too, but I love my live events. And it's like, you can see after they get past their initial fear, right? Their initial, oh my God, what if I can't do this? What if I really, really, really bad at it? What if, you know, you know, once they get past that, they are so excited and they just can't hide it. <laughs> and they, then so they like get to this place where it's like, where, you know, at first it's like partner up for readings and they, and they're nervous and scared. But then the next day they are like, hook me up with somebody. Let's do this. You know, I want to see what else I can do. I want right. to see how far I can push this. I want and then to they're see floating how... down to the, to the room the next day. And they're like, that dream you had last night, that was this. And this means that, right. and, you know, I'm going to read your coffee cup when you're done with it. <laughs> so... Right. You can read your coffee cup. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's, it's true. It's like I say all the time that when my students leave like a four day class, they're high. Yeah, they are spiritually high. Yeah. And, you know, I have to, we have to tie a little string around their feet, you know, and a little put a little brick and so that they don't just lift off and yeah, go totally into fly the away. Sky. Yeah. <laughs> they don't love fly away. <clears throat> but that's, I mean, that's a big part of it. So, you know, you are talking around kind of like the main reasons why somebody, and this is funny because the episode pod of this podcast is why should you launch your spiritual business or your tarot business? But there's a lot of reasons why not that are really important to talk about. Right. Um, because and, that's what, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah and it's not even why me. not like not to not do your spiritual business, but what's stopping you from launching your spiritual business. We all have the ability to do it. Mm -hmm. It's easier now than it ever has been before to have your laptop, to get on zoom, to get on social media, to automate some things behind the scenes that I can you know, like go over in 20 minutes to show you how to set up an online practitionership. But that's the easy part, unfortunately, now, the internal work and the journey that you're on right now tends to be a little bit more fraught, as I think you have now in your how many years are we saying officially you've been doing what you've been doing? Like 35, <laughs> okay. 30 plus <laughs> years. Yeah, um, that Rad's been helping people unlock this journey, right? So Sometimes it's not even the journey that's difficult. It's the putting your first foot on the path that's difficult. It's letting go of the things that you've been holding on to. It's, it's like clearing things out. It's getting rid of these beliefs that you've been so firmly identified with of like, I can't do this. I you know won't be able to do that. This is too hard. Technology is scary. Like all of these things that we're holding on to and you're already setting yourself up for failure by thinking that you're going to fail. And I like, it's such a simple concept, but we talk about this all the time in your membership groups and in most of your classes. And when you talk about manifestation of like, even just that one part could, could be the first thing that's in your way. Right. Mm -hmm. It's fear. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it is a little bit scary, you know, it, and part of my path was I quit accounting in 2000 and went back to it in 2005 because I got scared. I, I was like, well, you know, what if I, what if I don't make it? What if I don't get there? I have a house. I have, you know, <laughs> I have dogs. I have stuff I, I, that I have to pay for. And I got scared and I quit. And the, you know, the, the angels very sweetly and smartly and, and shrewdly 
got me the worst accounting job possible on planet earth to go back to. And I made it two years and I'm like, I'm done. And, but by that time I had learned more. I had, I dipped my toe into more things, more, more, um, take, taking more classes, but that's not the thing more. It was like figuring out how to do the techie part, figuring out how to get my message out. And that time, you know, and then it, it ran, it ran, but it's like you, if you go into any endeavor with, with your primary feelings being fear, anxiety, then what are you going to get? You're going to get things that make you scared and make you anxious. Right. And it'll be every time you approach, the way I relate to it is because it took me probably five years to get to a point where I could even say out loud, this is what I do. Right. So it was really hard for me to even speak the words. Someone would ask me like, oh, hey, what do you do? And like you were talking about your party, meeting somebody for the first time, we've all had that happen to us over and over and over and over again. And typically the first question is, oh, what do you do? I know. And yeah. And so I would always be like, man, I do marketing. You know, I didn't want anyone to know. And so you have to imagine, like, if I'm vibrating at the level of, I don't want anyone to know, then everything Nobody's I was doing know. was invisible. <laughs> right. <laughs> you <know>? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so you have to be able to like shout it from the rooftops. But like Brad was saying, is like, there's so many steps that you have to get through to even get to that point. And it's, first of all, totally okay. There's nothing wrong with you. I think there's, there's a certain element of, the entrepreneurial spirit or traditional entrepreneurialism that's like, you know, burn the boats and just go for it and don't look back. I, that doesn't line itself up with anything mm -hmm. I believe about how we are supposed to be here on earth. And so I didn't approach it that way. I took my time with it. I let myself feel through the process. I, you know, got frustrated with it a little bit, but I always learned something or I always had a breakthrough afterwards. So I get what you're saying, Rad. It's like, you know, to be, to be in fear is definitely one thing and fear can paralyze you, but that's not what you did, right? You kept working, you kept taking classes, you kept working towards this goal. And you didn't just sit at home on the couch eating potato chips every night um, <laughs> waiting for it to happen. I'm sure there were one or two nights of potato <laughs> chips on the couch. But that's, I think a big part of it is you get so close to the thing and you get scared, right? And so you go into fear and you completely cut everything off and you step away from it. And it just, you know, it doesn't go anywhere because you yourself are now stuck and frozen energetically and you're you're vibrating at a level of like, I don't want anyone to know, or I don't want people to see me, or I don't think this is right, or like whatever it is that you're vibrating at. And then that just kind of like reverberates, goes out into the universe, and that's what you get back. So, you know, how do you rad at this point? Like if you were to think back to that moment, like what got you out of that, like, I'm I'm scared. This isn't working. I'm scared. I gotta go back to my accounting gig. What got me got me to there or got me out of it? Got you out of there, like once coming out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, a boss who was on three different kinds of antidepressants and none of them working, yeah. who liked to scream at you in front of other people for things that you didn't do or had nothing to do with you, and what I came there and. And this is a this is a little off, but I came there and with and found a miserable group of accountants that were going to work for me. They were miserable because of who they had been working for. And I came in and they told me which ones are the troublemakers. And I'm like, I made them my friends. You know, I I I turned that all on its ear and I brought in all these wonderful people. And so they were really upset when I left, but I left because I couldn't do it anymore. I, I just couldn't. I, I walked in to my office and tried to log on and I couldn't make myself log on. I just was like, I can't do this. This is not me. It's not who I am. And so I, I, I quit. And you know what I did next? I went and took an angel class. <laughs> because because it, it's not that I took was taking the class because I thought I was going to learn something. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be high again. Yeah. I wanted to be high. I had just been doing this accounting job for the government and I needed to like spread my wings and sh shed all of that. And so over the years, and this is something I think that I have sort of forgotten, but have recently re-remembered, re is that I need to go sit in the audience sometimes. 
I need to be the person that's doing the receiving. I love giving. I do. You know that you saw me in Florida. You know how I light up like a Christmas tree if you put me in front of a bunch of students who, especially if they don't know anything about it, those are my favorites. Those are the ones that I'm like, oh, come here, let me hold you. I'm going to, I'm going to make you high and high in a spiritual way. And, you know, public service announcement for anyone listening who has thought about working with Radley or thought about working with Angels or thought about working with Turo in any capacity whatsoever. Listen to what he just said. Some of his favorite teaching experiences are when everyone or a majority of the people in the room are brand new. So mm -hmm. take that message wherever you are in the world, wherever you are in your thought process or your journey of all of this and tuck that away for the moment that you have a thought of, I don't think I can do this or <clears throat> I'm getting weirdly emotional. Um, I, I don't mm -hmm. think I can do this or a thought of, of this isn't for me or that I'm not good enough or, right. you know, That's... like I don't like how would I ever compete with other people who've been doing it for 20 or 30 years. I just want you to hear that, like hear Rad's voice ringing in your ear the next time you have that limiting moment where you think, okay, well, I could never get there. I could never right. get to where Radley got. So why should I even bother trying? Rad, how old were you when your business took off? Um, I was um, 54, I think. Yeah. So, you know, 54 is a great age. I know, I don't remember the exact age Louise started her business, but Louise she Hay was... started... She was 64, I think. Yeah. So as far as I'm concerned, it's never too late to start. And so if that's one of the things that's on your mental checklist of why not to launch your tarot business, I would like you to erase that with a big pink sparkly magical eraser to get rid of that thought that it's too late for me, or I, you know, I will never be able to catch up or how will I ever, you know, be as good as those people. So that's, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because I feel like that's right on the top of the list for most people of like, oh, there's other people doing it and they're better than me. So why should I even bother? Well, and I think too, um, I, there's, I mean, there was a story in my life where I had gotten a reading with this guy. Okay. I, I wanted a reading from him because I had gone back to accounting. I was totally confused. I was like, okay, well, if that's not my life purpose, cause it didn't seem to work the first time, then what is my life purpose? And this guy, um, he was like, I, it was a phone reading. And the very first thing I said, he said was, what do you want to talk about? I said, I don't know what my life purpose was. And he said, yes, you do. And I said, no, you don't. No, I don't. And he said, yes, you do. No, I don't. Yes, I do. No, I don't. No. <laughs> and I was like, and we, we, this, we went on with this for 20 minutes and it was supposed to be an hour call. And I ended the call because I was so frustrated with him <laughs> for saying that. But the truth of the matter is he was right. But I had convinced myself that I couldn't do it, that I wasn't good enough, that I couldn't get ahead of the game. I, with, I couldn't find my way into the spotlight enough to help enough people to make it my life purpose. And so I had shut it off. Yeah. That's not my life purpose. And, and yet this guy was right. It's like, no, that actually is my life purpose. It actually is. And when I redoubled my efforts, when I, you know, went and shed my accounting stuff one more time, got high on angel dust and, and could walk back in, then I was like, okay, I am going to do this one way or the other. Right. And that was your just kind of just checking moment, which I think I also had like 2019, was around the time that I had a just checking moment where, you know, like I'd been living in Los Angeles for five years. I really, I'd kind of been going through the same loop every year and I wasn't really making any progress. And then this beautiful opportunity that felt painful at the time mm -hmm. kind of came into, into fruition and released me from all of that. Right. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking specifically like, Oh no, I got to go back and get a corporate job. Like that was, that was where it was at. Right. I was mm -hmm. totally in that space. So I went and applied to every big spiritual company that was out there because I said, look at this experience I have, look at all these people I've worked with. Like this makes sense. Let me go do this. And it was the same kind of thing. I, I was interviewing for the job. I'm not going to say who it was because uh, I'll probably get in trouble, but um, I was interviewing <laughs> for the job and they, somewhere the wires got crossed 
And the interviews were supposed to be with all these different departments that were inside of the company. And they thought that I was already hired. So I think they didn't know that they weren't supposed to tell me how bad it really was behind the scenes. Oh. So I was just, you know, like, hey, it's so great to meet you, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh, it's terrible here. We're all overworked and everybody's miserable. And, you know, we can't catch our breath between this. And, you know, they don't care about us and blah, blah. And that was literally getting that from multiple people that I was supposedly having interviews with. And again, the wires got crossed. I don't think they were crossed. I think that's exactly what was supposed to happen mm -hmm. to put right. that fear back into me, the opposite of fear to be like, run away from the thought that you need to go back to your corporate job, run away from the thought that this isn't going to work out, run away from the thought, like all these things that you have gotten into your own head about and thinking you're just going to have to step backwards. That's really what it felt like. It was like, I felt like I was stepping backwards and the universe was like, not on your life. We're mm -hmm. not letting you do this. And timing is always so perfect in these stories. I, I had given up. I was going back home to the East Coast. I'm on the flight and I had a purchase come through on my website and an email from a company in Switzerland that was saying, hey, we want to license your content. We want you to come to Switzerland and you know film a whole course and do all these things. And it was at like literally the last moment. It was right before I went back home and like begged for help from my parents. You know what I mean? Like I was mm -hmm. right on the brink of, of that point and I get this email and that email is what changed everything. But I think, you know, the key part in your story, the key part in mind is like, I never stopped trying. I think that was for me, like the, the thing that I knew internally, there was this voice that was like, okay, you gotta keep going. Like, I know this sucks, but you got to keep going. And for you, it's like the guy that was doing the call. It's just holding up this mirror to say, you totally know. And you're like, no, I don't. Yes, you totally know. No, I don't. I went through that for like years doing that to myself. And it makes you crazy. Mm -hmm. It's maddening because you do know. And for whatever reason, you can't let go of this thought. I don't know. Well, and I also think, you know, it's, I, I, I have two thoughts here. Let's, let's try to remember both of them. I mean, for sticky one, notes. <laughs> right, it's like sticky notes. One of those things I think too is like telling your story to other people and letting them give you feedback. Like, mm -hmm. for example, saying, I'm going to create a spiritual business and you tell people this and they're like, well, you're just going to lose your shirt. There's no way that's going to work. Are you crazy? What if mom finds out? <laughs> Right. And it's it's like you can't tell your story about what you are trying to create unless you are telling it to people who will support you and be excited for you and go and be a part of the manifesting of what you want to create. Mm -hmm. The other th aspect of that, too, is a Wayne Dyer trick that is like my favorite Wayne Dyer trick right now. And it is like the absolute no, I am not accepting I'm not accepting any any evidence, any stories, any whatever that says I can't do this. Mm -hmm. I refuse them. I will not have them. I am putting up an iron shield. Don't talk to me. I got stuff to do. And, and it's like, it's weird, but it works. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it does, it does work. It's, it's so long as you can really do it. Like I have something in my life right now, and I'm I'm like, no. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm really doing it. I am. Yeah. And it's nobody tells you this part about trying to do something like this. And I think it, it, it comes in many forms. Like I feel like this lesson has shown up in front of me multiple times and it's always about boundaries. Right. So mm -hmm. um, there's always the boundary of like, should I continue focusing on my own energy and my own thing or my friend who always needs something who really needs me is calling me on the phone. And should I stop what I'm doing and break the the flow of what I'm working on? to go and help my friend, right? Or I'm right in the flow of doing everything. And, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, something really fun is happening. And I want to go and do that. And it's disrupting me from what I'm doing. But I want the immediate satisfaction of going doing something fun. Or, you know, anything that comes up that breaks that flow or like crosses that boundary. And that every time you let it cross, it's like this transaction, right? And mm -hmm. it's, it, if, if you think of it as like a whole bridge, if you let somebody cross it or you yourself are crossing it, the only person that's paying for it is you because you're giving up the flow. You're giving up the energy of creativity. You're giving up the focus of what you've been working on. You're giving up the time that you need to do it. You're giving up the self-care that you need in order to feel brave enough to step in front of the spotlight, whatever it is for you. You know, there's this thing for boundaries. And I, I went to a, 
when I was living in Los Angeles, I went to go see Marianne Williamson talk mm-hmm. at the uh, the theater that she does the weekly thing, our monthly thing, I think. Um, but anyway, one of the questions that came up was exactly this. And her response kind of was, was great because she's such a like just tough. She's so tough on it, but she does it in a way that's full of love. But she was saying that boundaries are the highest form of self-love. That's all it is. You just have to look at it that way. So every time you're like, oh, I've got a boundary, but I feel weird about you know, enacting it or upholding it or keeping it built or, you know, supporting the structure of it, you have to remember that that's not you saying no, like energetically in a negative way, that's saying no to the other thing and yes to you, right? Mm -hmm. So that's like the Wayne thing. It's not like you're just saying no and being negative. You're saying no to this thing that doesn't support me and yes to me, right? Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think too, it's like, (laughs) hopefully, if you're trying to build a tarot business or an angel spirit, spirit business, whatever kind, we don't yeah. care. But if whatever you're trying to build, hopefully there is fun in that. Hopefully you don't have to like stop what you're doing to go do something fun, right? Because yeah. see how, see the way that you just represented that, not you mm-hmm. personally, but how that represents what you're trying to do to the universe. It's just, you're basically saying, this is not fun. So I'm going to go do something that is fun. But the whole aspect about it is it should be fun. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean it's not hard. Part of my life is writing. A big part of my life is writing. Writing is hard. It's hard. Uh, That's why I do way more decks than I do books. (laughs) (laughs) Right? That's that's why. Because books are hard. Decks are fun. And, but you have to have, you have to bring joy to what you're doing. You have to bring joy into what you're trying to create. And I I may have pulled the curtain a little too too far on that one because I, if I'm, you know, if we're turning this into a reading, um, that has been, I think, one of my biggest issues of getting to a point where, you know, like my business is going in the direction I want it to be is that I was constantly looking for other fun things to do. I was looking for distractions. I was looking for, Mm -hmm. you know, things to cross to be like, oh, well, this is important or this other thing's important. And I kept kind of playing this game of like, everything's more important than what I need to do. But it comes back to this kind of story that, that I don't know if we've all heard it, but I want to recontextualize it inside of all of this. When it comes to your spiritual gift and it comes to you sharing what you do and you being out there and helping people, you have to, as they say on the airplane, put your oxygen mask, mask on, first on first before you can help other people. And I spent the last whatever, whatever years, you know, not putting my own oxygen mask on first because I had a belief that I needed to help other people and it was more important than myself. Now that that's straightened out, things are moving so much more easily and it is a joy, but it wasn't a joy before because I was stuck in this loop of helping other people before I helped me. Well, and I know, I, Rad, you've also had that experience. Oh God, I'm such a people pleaser. <laughs> totally. I mean, it's like, it's my middle name is <laughs> people pleaser. <laughs> but, and, and, you know, but I have to think about that. You know, it's like, well, first, first of all, first of all, I have you and Sherry to kind of like snap out of it <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, but, but it's like, even in, you know, my personal life or in my work with like, my wonderful publisher, I still have to like go stop and go turn it down. What does the Radley pleaser say? Mm-hmm. You know, in fact, I have one of the things that I did with tarot is was to soften it, as you know, two of swords or two of air, which, whichever one you call it, is a card that is about make a choice. Mm-hmm. But in my teachings, one of the things I say is if two of air shows up, probably what is happening is you are trying to, you are caught between making a decision that would make you happy and making a decision that makes somebody else happy. Pick the one that makes you happy. Which is like a wild and completely insane prospect for a lot of people, right, especially if you are spiritually sensitive, especially if you're an empath, mm-hmm. especially, yeah. especially, especially if you do, you know, anything that has to do with healing, you're always in that mode of, oh, I got to do the thing that's better for other people. Right. And so I guess another kind of nugget to walk away from this episode of the podcast is like, you have to reverse the flow on that. Mm-hmm. And even if it feels uncomfortable at first, it will get more comfortable as you see how many people's lives you can change 
when you go from a one-to-one to a one-to-many. So when you move beyond just doing readings over the phone or readings in front of people or readings on Zoom one-on-one to when you're teaching a class or when you're doing mm-hmm. a group meditation or a practice circle or whatever it is that you're doing and you're lighting other people up and yourself, you know, so that's one more kind of piece of the puzzle here of why you should be doing this is that it seems counterintuitive. It seems counterproductive to focus on yourself in this way. But by doing that, it lets you help way more people than you ever thought possible. And that was a question I wanted to ask you, Rad, is when you first, first started, if you can tie more back to like the, the that second attempt where you were leaving that, mm-hmm. that horrible job, the universe was like, nope, Rad, we're not going to let you do this. And you're going back into it. You go to your angel class. Can you remember that kind of moment where it clicked for you that you're like, okay, if I do this or, you know, I'm doing this. Did you have a vision of now? What, I mean, has it, has it, I know I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but that's what these are for. Um, yeah. <laughs> what did you think was going to happen versus what's happening now? Like, is it, is it close? Is it, is it off or something still haven't transpired yet? But like, did you have a, even like a glimpse of where this could go for you? I did. And it yeah. went farther. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> it went farther. I mean, it really, it, it, it did because... I had this view, I well, actually, I did not see myself with making cards. I did not, I did not see that. That was that was a vision that the angels had for me. And they went, here, do this. And but I did envision being a spiritual teacher. I did did envision being on on stage in front of two or three hundred people. I did not envision being on stage in front of 2000 people. I didn't see that coming, you know, or even six, seven, 800 people. Um, I didn't, I didn't see that coming. I did, even though being a Hay House author was what I wanted. I, I, I thought it was going to be books, not cards. And when, you know, I got my first Hay House contract, it it was like, I am going to do this. I am going to take tarot and take the fear out of it and 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 reintroduce it to these people who are super, super sensitive. Mm-hmm. But I, I have definitely gone p- way past what I thought. I mean, my 10th deck is about to come out. My 10th deck since 2012. I have done 10 decks in 10 years, yeah. plus three books, plus two major video courses right. in 10 years. And I have another deck that's coming out in 2024, another deck that's coming out in 2023 that I didn't know about till yesterday, <laughs> <laughs> another in 2025. And it's like, yeah, sometimes I just have to pinch myself because I'm like, I can't believe this is my life. Yeah. But it wouldn't have happened if you had stayed in fear. It wouldn't have happened if you were distracting yourself. It wouldn't right. have happened if you didn't have boundaries. It wouldn't have happened if there were lots of other changes in your life that you had made to be able to do this and be able to work at this capacity. And I think what a lot of people may or may not know, and I'll I'll, you know, give you some kudos, Rad, and pull the curtain back even further, is that this is this is not like a you do it and then it's done and you're like, okay, well, that was great. You have been on a, a marathon for 10 years to get those done. There is no break between behind the scenes of, you know, the card the card deck gets kind of finalized in the thought and the concept, Red immediately goes to work. Then there's a whole round of other stuff. Then it has to launch. You got to launch the whole thing. And before you're even launching, you know, the deck for this year, you've already started working on this. Like, there's been overlap for you for All a decade. Time. Yeah. Oh, yes. Absolutely. But if it wasn't full of joy, you wouldn't be doing it. I think that I'm really clear on just as knowing you as a person that if there wasn't joy in this, you would have been, you would have been out of here. I do. I, I don't, I don't even know what I do, but I would do something else. Yeah. And I get but, that. But I don't have a clue what it would be. <laughs> but that's the thing. That's the boundary I think you put on it. Right. And I think I've put the same boundaries. If it's not, mm-hmm. if it's not bringing me joy and it's not uplifting me, and it's not making me happy. I don't really know if this is what I would do. I'll have to find another way. So Mm -hmm. I think that's another thing to consider when everybody's going into this concept of doing a business is what would you say to somebody if someone's doing the business and it's like 
not bringing them joy, what would you do? I'd say get another job. I mean, yeah. do something else. I mean, it's like, I, I mean, it's like, it, 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 I wouldn't even need to pull a card. I'd be <laughs> like, get out, you know? Well, but that's the, 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 the answer that I would have too. And I set you up for this question because there is in no sense of the imagination, any spiritual teacher out there, anyone that's a Hay House author, anybody, anybody, anybody that's doing it all on their own. Right. Mm -hmm. So everyone's got a support staff. You mentioned right. Sherry earlier. She's been a friend of yours. She's been with you for how many years now? Since 2000. Since 2000. So 23 years, you guys have been collaborating and with each other. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the part that everybody thinks, if I'm going to be in the spiritual industry, I have to be a teacher or a reader or this or that. I also wanted to kind of like plug the fact that you could support other teachers. Like there's ways for you to be involved mm -hmm. and sharing your gifts and using your talents and not necessarily be the one in front of the camera. I would prefer if you were the one in front of the camera. I think that everyone's got an important story and an important message and all this stuff to do. But if you find yourself thinking, okay, I'm doing it and it's just not working, there are other ways to pivot it so that you can stay in the bubble, but not necessarily be in the position you thought you would be in. So I know this is a tangent, but I just want everyone that's listening thinking like, okay, well, that's not for me. And I tried it before and I definitely didn't like it. And I don't know that I want to go back. I would encourage you to try it again using some of the the strategies that Rad and I have been developing because we are, we're taking the fear out of this whole experience. The same way that you took the fear out of Tarot, we're taking the fear out of launching your spiritual business, your Tarot business, your Oracle business, your angel business, or what have you. We are removing the fear out of it, I think, because number one, we both have done it, right? Mm -hmm. So we've, we've had to go through all of this and Rad went through a whole thing. Here's this history. I think we don't really talk about. I was a little baby bird when I started a Hay House many, 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 many years ago. And I was around at the at the very beginning of Angel Tarot, like that card deck that came out that I think defined who you were going to be for a lot of people, mm -hmm. that card deck, right, Rad? That was like yep. your moment where you were on the map, as far as I'm concerned, because yes. that's, that's when I showed up. So I knew about Mr. Radley Valentine way back when, and we <laughs> were there together when that whole beginning CACR, Certified mm -hmm. Angel Card Reader course right. started, right. and that kicked off a whole tour, and you were doing that all over. And then it got turned into a big course that was really successful. And then it got turned into CATR. So I've been able to watch this from afar, but you and I kind of met way back when then, and then we were reunited several years. Well, 2014 wasn't that long. Maybe, I don't know, how many years was it? 2014, like 15, 15, six, maybe six or seven years, something like that. Long enough for our Jupiter return or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was one of those moments where, um, and and I'll I'll tell this story too, and I won't name names, but somebody called me uh, out of the blue uh, on a recommendation from somebody else and said, hey, I have this problem with my technology behind the scenes on what I'm doing. And I was just curious what your thoughts would be, right? And so I could have gone in two different directions. Direction one would be the, the marketing route, which would just be to say, yeah, hire me. I'm going to cost X number of dollars a month to fix this whole thing and I'll rebuild it for you and it'll be perfectly functional and everything will be great. And then I would have lined myself up to be, you know, in a good position to get some work and make some money. And that didn't necessarily feel hundred percent honest. And so I told the truth, which was, you know, from my heart, I said, Hey, look, you know, you have enough clout to be able to go and call that company and tell them what you need and, and show them what you're trying to do. And they'll probably do it for you for free. And it turns out that's exactly what happened. And I get this big thank you and a big phone call. Like, thank you so much for helping me. It was the easiest thing in the world. It, you know, everything, everything, everything. And I let it go, right? And I was like, okay, I feel good about what just happened. I feel good about what I just did. And what the result of that was many, many months later was a email that came through from one Radley Valentine <laughs> and changed my life. Brad, you changed my life. Well, you changed mine too. I mean, because, you know, it is important to have somebody to help you, to support you. We were floundering, you know? It was like, we were really floundering. We were struggling to understand. And, and, and I used to be in charge of an IT group, okay, <laughs> in accounting. And, and I was really good at it. But something about social media, I just couldn't grasp it. I couldn't figure it out. I felt like we, we just somehow could not get traction under the tires. We just couldn't. And when you showed up, you were like, and we had traction. Yeah. I mean, it's like the very first thing we launched was very successful. 
And, and now it's like, now I get it. Now I understand how it works. Now I understand what all these marketing terms mean. Now I know, you know, I, I still probably can't, you know, push the right buttons. I could learn it if I had to, but you push the buttons. And so, but, you know, it allows me to do what I do. And what I want to do most is teach. That's what I want to do most. That is my favorite thing to do, period. I do love making decks. I do. But I love teaching more. Yeah. And you helped me to get a platform where I could teach more, you know, where I could have tens of thousands of students and, and, really, really spread, if you will, I'm going to say something Southern, spread the gospel of angels <laughs> and tarot, right? And and really like help people to walk, step out of their fear and into their power. Yeah. And think about the timing in which all this happened. I mean, right around the time of the very mm -hmm. beginning of one of the most challenging periods of time ever. Mm -hmm. And instead of us not having a solution or not having an option for people, we just open the doors in every way imaginable right? for people to get to you. And we did it in a way that was easy and people could do it from home and you could do it from home and it was safe and it was, it was everything safe. that we needed at that moment. Right. And, you know, when we were ready, we opened the doors up again in another way and we're going back to doing in-person events and we're doing bigger and bigger things. But I think, you know, in the midst of all of that, I, I have to focus on the the alignment of you know staying in staying in alignment with your soul is maybe the best way that I would put it or with spirit or however it is it makes sense to you it's like acting thinking being doing in alignment with the higher purpose uh or the higher message or the higher language of spirit or the higher language of your angels or however it, it kind of makes sense to put it for you is staying in the energy of that leads to good things um and I, I think if you had told me that at the beginning of my career I would have told you you were crazy uh, and that it, that's not true. And like, how do you know? And I would have been very kind of overly analytical about it. I don't know if you would have been the same way if someone would have whispered in your ear and been like, hey, you're going to be on stage and do all this stuff. If you would have fully believed it to the no. extent of what, yeah. So, no. but you stayed on the path, you stayed aligned with it. You kept doing the work, you kept showing up, you kept learning, you know what I mean? So I think you did what, what everybody should do or, or you know, to the capacity that you can keep reading the books you know, keep watching the millions of YouTube videos that are out there about things that you love, keep practicing, keep, you know, sharing your gift, keep doing all of these things. And, and at some point in my mind, you will get past this, this, these limitations of like, I'm not good enough, or, you know, like I, why should I, why should my voice matter? You know, I can't catch up with those people. It's too late for me. Like all of these things that are kind of stopping you from even like energetically turning this on, you know, so to speak for yourself. Um, that to me is is the part of why Radley's teachings and my teachings gel so well, because we're removing that fear. We're removing the fear of like, oh no, what will happen if? And then we can kind of almost change the energy of the exact same question, just with different energy of like, what if, you know, like the excitement right, exactly. of like, what if, what if, oh my gosh, what if, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if this all of a sudden happens? What if I do this and it gets the attention of that person? What if I act in this way and it opens the door to this kind of relationship? What if I do this? What if I do that? And changing the energy around the question, what if, um, and, and really leaning into the fact that, and, and again, I go back to these kind of three things and we talked about this before, and I'll bring it up again, is that if you're going to have like these paranoid thoughts of like, oh no, if I step out and do my spiritual business or if I launch myself or if I do this or I do that, something bad's gonna happen. You have to then also give energy to something totally amazing, wonderful, fantastic, life-changing, transformational, magical, all those things could happen too. Like right. if you're gonna go bad, you have to go good too in order to stay kind of in the balance of of what where we need to be, I think. Right. Well, and yeah. I think too, for me, there's a little bit of paying it forward because, yeah. you know, it's like I, when I was first starting to like dabble in this and trying to like make a business out of it and stuff, I I wasn't looking at other Hay House authors and going, I can't do that. I was looking at other Hay House authors and going, if they can do it, I can do it. Wow. And, and what was also helpful was... I was being told by those Hay House authors, you can do it. 
Wow. You can do it. And I just, I believe them. <laughs> yeah. So pay that forward. We're paying it forward to everybody. We're paying Brad's it forward. You, it's like, let me convince you yeah. that you are good enough and that you can do this and that you can have the boundaries and you can get support from other people and you can do it. Yeah, You can. If I can do it, you can do it. There's nothing more we need to say. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're interested in finding out more about what we're doing, what we've been up to, how you can get involved in all of this, I would invite everybody listening to come on over to RadleyValentine.com forward slash biz, B-I-Z. <laughs> and you're going to be signing up for something really cool. <laughs> we are going to be doing a three-part video series on exactly this, you know, giving you even more information on how to get started, why you should get started, things that you could be doing, ways of looking at how you could be expanding even more past doing one-on-one -on -one readings and more even into teaching or doing bigger events or bigger virtual events or in-person things, all the stuff that we do behind the scenes. We're kind of pulling, I keep using that phrase, we're pulling the curtain back. Where's that from? Wizard of Oz, probably. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, and, and it's pay not no a attention disappointing. to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, but pay attention to us because we are behind the curtains and we want to show you exactly how this is done so that you can go and do this. As Rad saying, like, you can do this. And until you believe it, and we're going to get you there, but until you believe it, we'll believe for you. Right. We will. We'll believe for you. Well, Mooney, thank you. This has been a delight. I always love spending time with you. And for those of you who are out there, you can find me at RadleyValentine.com. It's literally the portal to all things Radley Valentine, but I am on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, and uh, I am on mindbodyspirit.fm. Thanks, Rad. Bye.